first question. <laughs> oh. First question. Well, it's not going to be a question, but welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the High Soapbox. I am joined today by the lovely Miss Rochelle Wilson, the leader of the Make Some Intelligent Noise Reform Movement, which is a prison reform movement here in Wilmington, Delaware, and she has uh, has given me uh, the courtesy of being able to sit down and have a conversation with her today. Now, for my listeners of the podcast, if any of you are wondering why at times we'll be referencing stuff like it, things might sound a little weird, it's because we were also recording this um, IRL while we're doing this and it's currently being streamed live. Yes. So, um, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me to do this and giving my voice a platform. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, Evan. If, if Starting with a lighter question, have you ever, has you, have, has some, has some, has one, some of the people you've worked with who were formerly inside and then came out, um, have you ever had a, have you ever had a prison cuisine before? Prison cuisine? Yeah. Um, okay, so I work a lot with the returning citizens, mm -hmm. that's what we call them, returning citizens. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who have been in prison and they are now coming home. And I work with them a lot over one particular location, mm -hmm. a safe house, and I, I kind of hang out there. I've never had any of their cuisine, but it's interesting you asked me about that. My son was just telling me about something that he created. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think of the name of He put oodles and noodles with um, some sort of um, cheese doodles or something like that. And soy sauce, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, that I've never had it. But he says, Mom, it tastes, <laughs> it tastes just like, you know, the stir fry from the Chinese restaurant. So, you know, one of the things that I definitely want to do when I get my son home, I'm going to take him out to all the restaurants. How much longer, how much longer he got? According to the judge, if he has the judges have his way, it'll be another 12 years. What did he do? My son robbed a liquor store. With when, he was young, when he was young and stupid? He was young and stupid. He was 22, just turned 22. He was my, he was my age. Yeah. And, you know, you're not really fully developed mentally or cognitively until you're about 25. 25. But even then, I would argue that so. some people don't have enough life experience until they're in their 30s. Well, I, I want to be honest with you, and I want to be candid, but I also have to be careful lawfully um, just because there are people in this world that are do malicious. not appreciate what I do. So if they could hurt me or sabotage me, and I don't want to give them any, any credit to do that. Yeah. But I will say that um, my son was two weeks away from going into the United States military, the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. He had worked for 15 months to meet all of the criteria above and exceed above the guidelines of what was asked of him, mm -hmm. and he did it. His ASVAB score was so high that uh, they gave him a choice of what it is that he wanted to do, and he said he wanted to become a sniper for the United States military, and that's that's where he was on his way. Yeah. He was on his way, and, and then, then he did one, something and the, and stupid. And the one is in the one of his friends decided, hey, and then he says, ah, sure, whatever. They were at a party. Somebody runs out of alcoholic beverages, says, hey, somebody, let's make a, let's make a liquor store run. Well, my son is driving. He has a car. So him and another person jump in the car and decide to this, take off. And this other person decided not to tell him that he wasn't, that he was uh, going to make a, um, not make a, a purchase. A legal purchase. purchase. Well, I, I have to say, you know, my son never revealed to the prosecuting attorney um, who that other person was or all of the circumstances. He took the charge all by himself, and uh, that other person never stepped forward or took accountability for it. And Justin has this thing that I guess still works today. I don't know. And I can't say I agree with it, but it's called the no snitch rule. And I mean, rather I mean, than him tell the prosecutor who the other person was, he took the whole hit. Here's my thing. I agree with that no snitching thing, but in it's it's in a case of like say if say if I'm say if I'm like I'm like Grimy, I'm I'm not going nowhere in my life. And then one of my friends, like it like that no snitching policy, at least to me, that right there with your son's story happened in reverse in my mind. That friend of his 
should have come forward and said, yo, this was all me and not named him at all. Because here's but, the thing, you're but, supposed but to- But in a real world, Evan, in a real world, people if you and I decide to do a liquor store run and it's my bright idea to, to take Stick the liquor yeah. without you know ask, uh, paying for it and you're just kind of standing there, but you my boy. See, out in the streets, they got this thing where like, you my boy, you my peoples. So if let's just hypothetically say the other person was the, was the actual culprit, I t- I t- but I t- he's I t- saying part- Justin, you my boy, you look out for me. Justin's gonna look out for him because that's you know he's right. a loyal well, friend, right? But this, so. you know, I maybe it's because me and my my boys are just are a little different. Like, she got it. Sorry, she for my, for those listening, she got a phone call. Right? <laughs> yeah, and I thought I had put my phone on. Uh, it's all good. But um, the, the way I've always I, I, I look at it is just you know it's 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 you should, like I I it's like like say, say take like Michael like Michael Vick that whole thing with him fighting dogs and all that yeah how's his cousins but he took the hit for it right and here's the thing here's what you, what his cousin should have done like when 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 the police came and knocked it out he they should have been like was this Michael Vick nah it's me like. To, to, but, but, three, but that takes dollar fine, slap on the wrist. We but that takes out. that takes a lot of inner moral character and a code of ethics within no. yourself. That's what, to stand up. Let me finish. Yeah. To stand up and admit that you were wrong, that you ha- that you're the culprit, and that you take full accountability for some something that has taken place. Now, let me just re- backtrack. At the time that my son was sentenced, he was 22 years old. He was sentenced to more time of prison than he had lived on this planet. He was sentenced to 25 years for a liquor store robbery that he really had very little to do with, but we can't prove that at this point, so there's no need to even try to bring that up to a prosecuting attorney at this point because Justin is not ever going to say that person's name uh, so he took the hit on his own. Because. But the judge, the judge, Evan, the judge was a good old boy from Sussex County. And if you know anything about Delaware, you know that's where the good old boys are still, you know, as the songs say, you can smell strange fruit hanging from the trees. They're still, still hanging folks from trees down there. And my son is one of those people because the judge is who he is. The judge is who the judge is. This is why I don't leave Wilmington. Because <laughs> my thing is, is, is and this is, goes into 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 uh, uh, blue, po- uh, uh, policing and stuff like that. I I have, despite my complexion, I am just as terrified of the cops, and maybe not terrified, but I am extremely apprehensive okay because it doesn't matter black or white what matters is a cop thinks he's above us a man who is born with just as many rights regardless of skin like it's 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 part of the reason why when you like say like when you like the, the cops that shoot unarmed people for blank regardless they're all different types of races and ethnicities, and I don't. And I see. I while it, while while I while there is definitely an issue between between cops and the black community. I think it's just being hyper focused on that is ignoring the big the, the overarching problem, which is the blue wall of silence. Which is there is a there are there are people who are who feel like they are above us. Mm-hmm. And feel like they can act as if they are above us. There was a, I think, in 06, there was an FBI. And, and it has nothing to do with color, but all about power. Power. Right. And now, I'm not saying that color has nothing to do with it. Uh, there's definitely something there, but it is a piece of a of a larger grotesque puzzle. In, in 06, I think, I believe it was 06, the FBI put out a report saying that, that, that white supremacist groups all over the country, low to high, high to low, south, north, everywhere, East West were actively going into law enforcement all over the country. <laughs> there was and, some, and yes. they and, and, and they peti- and they told the Bush or administration at the time, "You have to do something because this could be bad." Because back in the old days, you had Joe the cop. 
Joe the cop was from the community. It's like if he if like there were two there was like two if there was like a, if like if a kid was did something like illegal and all that. It's like he didn't bring him to the precinct. He brought him home. Right. He brought him to he brought him to he brought him to his mama, which is or dad, which is worse. You know. And there, again, it, that was only the ones that had your complexion. They they went home. They were taken to mom and dad and told of their of their mischievousness. If they had a complexion that was darker than yours, they usually were taken to the precinct. I mean, and we know this from the ages of time. Right. We know right. that. Right. right. I'm not, and I'm not. And I'm not just counting that. I I will say that in smaller towns where you have a population of a thousand, two thousand, might be a little bit different. You know, but in, in places like New York where you have things like the Central Park Five and all that yes. stuff. Like, like, when you live in a city of thir- like three, four million people, the human mind is only able to comprehend 150 people in your tribe. <laughs> and our attention span is only 12, 11 to 12 seconds long. I mean, I can only stay focused as a human being, a grown woman, I'm 56 years old, according to science, I can only stay focused for 12 seconds and then my mind is thinking about the email I need to send later, the paper I need to write, the speech that's coming up and, you know. It's even harder for me. (laughs) And feed the dog. It's even harder for me as a web developer because I have to build websites to catch somebody's eye within three seconds. Because that's how, because you think, your mind may wander after 12. But you get bored with what you're looking at in front of you after three. Really? Yeah. Well, think, it depends think, on what you're, what you're looking at. Think, think, <laughs> think, what's in front of you. Think about Instagram or Facebook. Mm-hmm. Like, think about short, quick. Right. What, and like, that's it. Like, have you ever seen like a video that like it, like you like you're saying it has a caption saying uh, uh, "ador uh, adorable Schnauzer puppies" and then you see right. like pictures of mice or whatever in the beginning and just like you move on, move on right. because it's not what you wanted. It's not. It's, it's like you, you have to catch somebody's eye in the first three seconds. In the first three seconds, and you have to catch their attention, and then you have to hold it. I notice oftentimes when I do my Facebook Lives, um, when I first started off, I would do this, this long, drawn-out, trying because I'm a high school teacher, so I'm used to explaining things in detail, but you cannot do that uh, because adults are going to flip the page. They don't want to see whatever you're talking about. If you haven't caught their attention in the first five seconds of your Facebook Live, they're going to go on. Right. And, and I and often it, found that it might be 10 people will chime in at once, and then it'll go to seven, and then it'll be down to four. And then before you know it, I've got one person uh, watching and until uh, later on. So, yeah, the attention span is short, mm-hmm. and it's very difficult with so much outer stimulation, the stimuli in our lives every day. It's very difficult to stay focused. I, I doubt seriously, like I have three people right now who were tuned in. I do not know how long they're going to stay with me. It all depends on how, how interesting the conversation is. Right. Too but much other stuff going on. Earlier you said how you were t- that like when you were being used to a teacher, long drawn out informations and all yeah. that stuff. But let me ask you a question. If you were to go back to being a teacher tomorrow, would you still do that? I... Would you, or would you change how you're... Or, I would. Sorry, um, we had. We had <laughs> so, sorry to my podcast listeners. We had uh, somebody sitting in, and she didn't turn off her. Uh, she ringer. did not turn off her ringer. Um, I think that if I had an opportunity to go back to becoming a teacher, which honestly, if I, if I ever can become impactful enough in this movement to make a difference, to make some reform changes, then I would be very interested in pursuing a career back what, as a no, teacher. No, what I mean is, but if I went back as a teacher. If I had an opportunity to be a teacher again, what would you change about your and teaching And stand style? up in front of my babies. First, I would recognize that, again, the attention span is short. So you want to get in, concise, tell them what's going on, and keep it pushing. And then, if the student needs help, they'll ask for it. Or if I just kind of peruse around and work individually with the students, I think that would be better. But the way I was trained is to stand in front of the classroom, give out the instructions, explain what needs to be done, and then you walk to the students and say, do you need help, or how can I be of assistance but to they, you? But they might have needed thing. help 20 minutes ago when you were like 10 minutes into your spiel. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where... The it's, new versus the old. Like, it's... <laughs> it's like, it's, I think that's, I mean, 
I think that's just I think that's part of the reason why some teachers are just so dead set against things like Common Core and all that. It's because I'm not saying it's the best way to go about teaching kids new stuff, but obviously the original way was not doing it. Like like in this country we in in this country we have like we we we, we the schools are are, are are intended for people to make this type of person someone just smart enough to run the machinery do the paperwork do their job but not but just dumb enough to like not realize how badly they're getting effed over every day of their lives pretty much you know pretty so much don't don't qu- don't oh don't and qu- the dumber you are and, and the more willing you are to be... Uh, willful have, ignorance. Willful ignorance or willing to, to have a place of servitude, mm-hmm. uh, the more I'm going to allow you to be the person that works for me or does the extra jobs or, you know, because it's a no-brainer. You're a no-brainer. And it's very easy to get a no-brainer to do almost anything, especially if they have a willing heart. But I want to go back really quick to something also... Um, so last night, I went to a very, very wonderful event. Mm-hmm. It was held at the Easy on Mount Carmel Church, mm-hmm. and uh, we were talking about gun violence and how to save our American youth. Well, particularly here in the city of Wilmington, we, got, we have to start here. Sure. But you know, Wilmington being the first state, or Delaware being the first state, Oftentimes, Virginia will catch on. It'll pick up uh, New Jersey, New I think, York, I think, and then it'll I think, spread I, I think out in like a rippling Flint, effect. I think Flint got it at uh, once. So, so my question to you would be: Is is the, the, the gun violence in, in Wilmington is a very interesting like concept to me? We've talked about it before, but I'll reiterate my points and stuff here. We'll, yes, uh, live and speak a little louder. Of course, of course. So, and we are back from uh, that brief commercial break, and I was about to ask Miss Rochelle here about <laughs> the. Um, so that event was about you were mentioning was about gun, gun violence, violence in the inner city and stuff like that, and I mean the way I look the way I look at it is it's I just see it as 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 a bunch of kids who don't understand what respect is saying they disrespected me so I took their life. Yeah. You know, in a way, they don't. They're not fighting over territory. They're not yeah. fighting over rackets. They're not fighting over product. They're not fighting over. They're not. They're not fighting over anything that they can take and turn into liquid money and put back into their community. You know, it's very sad, and and it's even sadder that it has to come from, uh, you know, from a young white male to say exactly what I'm thinking. And last night, as I sat in that meeting, and so many people were there, elected officials, the community came out. I was so happy that the community came out. They stood up, they offered their suggestions. And I'm telling you, uh, before we leave today, I wanna just tell you some of the suggestions that the audience came up with that I absolutely support. Let's hear them. Well, I will, but I wanna say, um, if I move too fast, (laughs) I'll lose my train of thinking because you cut me off. So try not to cut me off. My apologies, my apologies. What I wanted to say is, uh, see, now I forgot, and it wasn't important. (laughs) I'm going to kill you, Evan. I deserve it. I'm going to kill you. Oh, 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 okay, I know what I was going to say. My friends say that all the time. (laughs) Um, That you have to say exactly what I was sitting in the audience thinking last night. Like... With all of the wonderful suggestions that people made, it really comes down to young people being able to respect themselves and each other. They are killing each other in some cases over product, okay, paper money, and things associated with paper money. And then in some cases, what you just said. An Instagram said. comment. They're, they're killing each other over an Instagram comment. Oh, he disrespected me. Oh, blah, blah, you know. And again, the street has a different culture than what our, you know, cherry wood desk sitting people up in, you know, over at the federal building. They, they don't understand that. They're, they're sitting there with shiny shoes and pretty blue suits on at cherry wood desk, and they have no idea what it's really like in the streets. And, it, and, it and a young person can get killed in a heart just because he's over here. And he's not supposed to be in this neighborhood because he's from another neighborhood. And, and it hurts because it's like, I am, for all intents and purposes, an outsider in this. I am from a hick, 
podunk as county in Maryland. I moved here when I was nine. I've lived here ever since. It's my home. I love this city. Delaware is my home. I mean, I, I don't think I would have been able to start a business as easy as I did if I was in Maryland because, whoo, <laughs> boy, those things. But the point is, is is that I have people who – I have friends who are basically my family at this point because I don't really ha- – I don't have too much family still living in state that I can, like, you know like, – like, I got family that I love and I care about, but they – like like there's a hand they've got other things going on i can't call on them like that you know they have their own lives i have friends that i can love and trust and rely on and some of those friends are 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 having to deal with this dynamic and i i and it's like and you and i had a very candid conversation about very if i had stayed in that podunk county if i had stayed in a place that basically was all people who looked exactly like me i probably wouldn't have given a hoot or holler about this because, but I do not because not be, because I because, because it affects you personally it, now. It, it affects and it affects yes. my loved ones. Yes, and here's the thing: I would never have started a criminal justice and prison reform movement if it didn't come knocking on my door. And what does I that say? I was very happy being a high school teacher. And what does that say about those people with the shiny shoes and Des at the city building? Yeah. What does that say about the company that they? They don't. It's, it tells me that they aren't. Fr- they aren't in the community. It tells they're me, not in it, the community. It tells me that but, but, they would that they have forgotten. They some love. of them have never even been in. They would be petrified to walk the city streets just from one corner to the next, because they would be petrified that someone's going to hurt them. Oh. They would. They would. They would just. Stick out like a sore thumb, dude. You're, you're, dude. You're on Tattnall Street. You're fine. Shut up. Right. <laughs> like, but you know, I would never expect John Carney, the governor of the state of Delaware, to put on a pair of jeans and sneakers and and just say walk up Market Street Mall by yourself without all of his uh, his bodyguards and Secret Service and all of these people. Just, just John Carney, just walking up the street, maybe to the Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. Yeah. He would never do I mean, I can't imagine. You don't know he why would, he did But that? you know what? I Coons, saw him Coons, in Coons sneakers. Coons did. Coons did. I saw John Carney in sneakers and jeans cleaning up something over, I think it was in Southbridge, and it was shocking. I'm like, the governor of the state of Delaware is cleaning up Southbridge, like literally picking up trash off the ground. That's when I knew that, like, I don't have to agree with everything that he says in terms of policy, but him, the man, I like him. Because you can come out of your desk, out of your office, from your shiny desk and your shiny shoes, put on some sneakers and jeans, and get out here with the people, the real people, because they don't get any realer than over in Southbridge and Riverside. That's, that's real people. I'm from Northside. Well, yeah, well. <laughs> well, well, the, well, the white part, but... <laughs> But, you know, for you to be the one to make the statement that it's all about young people, that's one of the things they said last night at this, at this forum. Mm-hmm. One of the things they said is that we have to have more young people. The people themselves, they have got to be the ones in, in, in the group. And I said that the last time. And I felt like, you know, no one was listening to me. People don't take me seriously because I'm a one one woman band. But when you have when you have <laughs> twenty, thirty people saying the same thing to Yes. It kind of Yes. You know, I was watching And that's what they said last night. Right. Get the young people involved. Another thing they said that was extremely poignant um, was allow the men of every color, every nationality, allow our men. To get out here, particularly our felons, our ex-felons, which we now call returning citizens, allow our returning citizens to get into the crevices and the cracks and the corners where the young people are doing the things that they're doing, their involvement. Let them get in there with them and actually guide them and be mentors to them and, and teachers and father figures and big brothers. Allow the men to do that. You know, I, I I agree completely, and I would say we could even take it a step further. Have you? So I was, and I was, and I was actually watching this last night while I was working on a client site. Uh, I was I had in a um a video on YouTube. It was Killer Mike talking on some interviews, Breakfast Club, Joe Rogan Experience, something. But 
he was talking about how he is he with some with a small group like some small like young young guys like like teenagers in Atlanta like a young group of Crips, <laughs> and and getting them into in like these little street street fraternities and and talking about how to basically taking the Hell's Angels model of of yeah yeah we yeah one percent of us may be a uh, a criminal enterprise but the other ninety nine percent of it. We can sell you a T-shirt, but the point is, is, is that moving these kids from doing stuff that has nothing to do with nothing into building an enterprise. You know, I'm just, yes. I, I would love to get into the ear of some of these kids and just say, hey, like, you know, you know what you could do, like, you could, like, he, he, and here, and here's the best part: we're in Delaware, which is one of the most business-friendly states in the union. Yes. And it would be so fucking easy for some of these kids to just pull, like, pull, each of them pull 20 bucks together and then be able to go get a years-long business license with all of them as, as, as contributors and shit. And then, and then they can just do, and they can, then they can start, a, like, in the summer, they can start a car washing operation. They could, it, and it, it, they could start, they could start buying bottled water and all stuff kinds and selling of it. Yes. They could, like, like, they could, they But well, we've got to get them you know, where the east side won't try to kill the west side and the north side aren't trying to kill the east side. And in order to get them together to collaborate, to do a project together mm -hmm. is fabulous. I would one rather of the things them said compete for night, money than compete for blood. One of the things that was said last night is to allow more arts. And we've got to start them at little babies, four, five, six, three, two, one, you know, start them young, mm -hmm. get them involved in the arts, all kinds of arts. It's just so medicinal. It's like chicken noodle soup for the soul, you know, and it gives them something else to do, to look forward to, to be creative uh, so that their minds kind of get away from, oh, he disrespected me on Instagram. Wilmington used to be. Wilmington used to be one of like the big, uh, like like a real big like underground hub for hip hop. Even yes, you know, and I'm just yes. and, and it's and 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 I'm bring that back exactly. Bring and just, that back, and, and I wonder like, you know, it's, you know, I I I I mean, one of the things an old project I had with an old friend of mine, Brian Ortega, uh, at at No Dot Two on Instagram, check him out. He, we tried to do a thing called 302 Perp, which was originally called, um, um, uh, uh, basically stands for Delaware Public Eye uh, uh, Rapping Community. Oh. You know, and, and originally it started as a kind of good effort to like, to put people under an umbrella and just unify and do all that stuff. And you know what? And we, it, we had, when that fell through because we were we were he was he was like fifteen and I was seventeen and we didn't have any money, cloud or contacts. We just ended That's up turning we ended up turning it into a record company and that fell through. That's a whole other story. But you know what? I think you just really hit on a on a on a piece of gold there. You know, it was Delaware, Wilmington, the city of Wilmington was a hub for underground, you know, hip hop and rap and singing and the arts. And I remember, you know, as a young person ripping and running around, you know, we would be able to go to the barber shops and hear the latest CDs. Whoever was trying to become the up and coming rap star, you had made your own CD and they, where do you take them? You take them to the barber shop. That's the first place they're going to go. So if we could find a building, a big place, there's a place here in Wilmington called the Wind Factory, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's what it's called. Over, um, I think that's the name of that place. Anyway, it's really, really huge. The warehouse, not the wind factory, the warehouse. Mm -hmm. And the warehouse, it used to be Prestige Academy, a school in which I once worked as a teacher. What um, happened to Prestige? Well, that's a whole other story. But if they could take that building, the warehouse, and create on Saturdays a musical, hip-hop, underground kind of funky atmosphere for the young people to come and record their music if they think they're you know they're the next Jay-Z or the next Nas let them come into the warehouse and record that is a way to unify them because then it doesn't matter if you're from the east side or the north side or whatever side you're from mm -hmm. You're at that moment focused on making your music, on your rap, getting your lyrics out, expressing yourself. And even if you never get a CD, it's a place where they can go and vent. And I do say to start, we need to have a very high police, uh, you know, presence 
just to get started. But People I think after a while, once you realize would, that we're how like, like yeah, the it's only, gonna be okay. The only piece then difference is the dirt we live on. The only difference is the dirt we live on. At least the young people that go there, whether it's Northside, wherever you're from, if you want to go there, or if you're from Centerville, I mean, we've got young white boys who want to be rap artists. You know, I mean, uh, I, I love him. What's his name? Eminem. Oh my God, I love Eminem. I don't care what anyone says. I think he's very, very uh, artistic. Even, even though he's basically but made, even though he's only. If we, if we allow this place, this space, for these young people to do that. Mm -hmm. Evan, I think that would cut down a lot on crime. I agree. I, I agree know. entirely. And it's like, I think it, it, I think there's like three points. It's just, it's, 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 it's art. It's, it's hustle. And it's, 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 it's heart. And it's, and, and heart, not like art, heart, and, and, right. and, and hustle, you know? Right. It's, it's, you know, I, I, you know, part of the reason I don't want to leave, uh, I, I, I want to stay in Wilmington is, is, is to hark it back to our last conversation, our last conversation, which was over police brutality and stuff like that. Um, the police in Wilmington. Yes. What you said. D said. <laughs> so just for. D, so just, D Lo says, uh, and we can invite other famous artists to judge their talent. I think that's right. You need to allow people to video, to video in. I don't know. She says that should know. allow people I, to video in. I don't know I, what that means. Know. But, um, but for, I for, like the other ideal about having other artists right. come in for my for my listeners of the, the po for my listeners of the podcast. Um, like I said, we were we're doing this live and we have people commenting and Miss and Miss Wilson here was reading out one. Of the <laughs> yes, I have someone who's commenting and I appreciate it. But but let's um, really briefly just get to the crux of why you invited me here. Yeah. Um, t uh, for this interview or for this conversation in the, today. In the, in the last 10 minutes. In the last 10 minutes, right? We've talked about everything except <laughs> criminal justice and prison reform. So if I could just have a brief moment to say this. Uh, to your listening audience, many of the people from my Facebook page and the people that do support me, they already know my story. But for your listening audience, I will say, uh, say it again. So my name is Rochelle Wilson. I am the mother of Justin Wilson. Justin Wilson is currently residing at James T. Vaughan Correctional Center in Smyrna. He was sentenced to 25 years of incarceration for a liquor store robbery in Georgetown, Delaware. And uh, so it's been 10 years. He was 22 at the time. He's now 32. And um, it's going to be 44. No, don't say that. Don't please don't say that out loud. I rebuke that. That's not true because you just took me all the way off by saying that. He will not be 44 when he gets out, Evan. God willing. He will be home long before then because God willing, the strength and the power and the authority that God has given me to start this movement. I started it because of a vision that came to me at three o'clock in the morning. And I got up and I began to move in the spirit of obedience to that. And by the grace of God, it's two and a half years later, now I'm in it. And it, I started it for Justin. It was Justin who then took the movement and said, no, we're not gonna make this just about me, mom, because of people in here that he has gotten to know, people in here that I know, mom, need a mother like you. They don't have you as a mom. So you got to fight for all of us. So that's how Make Some Intelligent Noise came about. I would love to meet your son. And uh, yes, and hopefully I pray. Some, hopefully someday soon. Very soon. Very soon. If I, you know, I've tried to have, let me put it this way, because you, you screwed me up with I'm, that I'm one. I'm sorry. I didn't you blew mean me to. off with I'm that so sorry one. I didn't yeah. mean, I'm just like, I'm just sad. Um, I'm just sad. So... I, um, I have never asked any elected official for anything. Like, can you help me go do this for Justin? Or can you go get Justin out of jail? No. I looked for an attorney that I thought would be able to help my son. 
And I hired an attorney who made me promises that he could have Justin Didn't home in an hour. I mean, not an hour, in, in a year and a half, I'll have Justin home because I'm the one that can do it. I'm the attorney who has the power and the connections. You got, you went to lawyer Wade, didn't you? I'm not gonna say who he was. <laughs> I'd rather not say who that attorney was. Not at this time but, uh, anyway. I, I know, but get back but, to the prison but the, but the But the point is, yeah, when you intercede and yeah, like I'm, that, I'm, you I'm, throw me I'm off. I'm sorry. That's not good hosting. Yeah, I know. Uh, you, so you. <laughs> the, point, the point is, Ugh. I started Make Some Intelligent Noise, criminal justice and prison reform movement, because I wanted to help Justin. Justin then turned it to help everyone, help as many as I possibly could. Bless that, man. I tried to gain the support of the people using Facebook because I'm a very private person. I would have never used Facebook, but I'm a media journalist. So I said, I'll just use what I have. Do what you do. To try to get the people to stand with me. If I can get 50,000 mothers, because I know we have 50,000 incarcerated people, if I can get the mother or the wife or the sister or the daughter of 50,000 women to stand with me on a federal, federal level because federal trumps the state, you know, and demand some changes and some reforms, then I will have done my job. But by, uh, you know, some form or fashion, that did not work for me. I did not have 50,000 women that stood up and said, yes, we want to join the movement. We're 100,000% standing with you. I didn't get that. So I said, what can I do as a one woman show? What can I do to be impactful? The only thing that I could think of again, was to hold my elected officials accountable, as well as teach the law. If I can teach and help every family that has a case proceeding, a coming up case in front of a judge, and I can tell them or help them in any way, then I have, I have been very impactful because that's one less person that they're going to bamboozle the way they bamboozled my son and myself. So that's my way of fighting back, to hold our, account, uh, our elected officials and judges accountable, and that's my way of fighting back and teaching the law to the people that do not know it. That's how I fight back. You know what, you know what I think about that? I think, I, think, I think two things primarily. One, the work you're doing is very, very good, and I think it is going to, and it makes an impact on the community whether you see it or not, and I think, I think that, you're, that your rewards on earth or above are going to be plentiful and bountiful um, with just as long as you keep being persistent with time. And the second, man, if, you're, if I was a scumbag politician or prosecutor, I would hate to have you, like you're like the worst person, like you'd be my worst enemy. <laughs> you're like the worst person. There are people field. who run when they see me. There are people I won't say who because I, I think it's best that I don't. It's better, it's better to be cordial and kind than yes. confrontational. But when they see me walk in the room, the moment they see me walk in the room, they scurry to go that way or either over that way. Wherever it is that Rochelle Wilson is, they want to go in the other direction because they're afraid. Miss Wilson, you are a better <laughs> person than I because I'd be in the corner like, Hey, don't be pussy, come back, mom! <laughs> Oh, well, I do it my way. Uh, After I kind of saunter around the room and say hi to like, everyone, I kind of saunter my way over to wherever how, they are. And I make sure I shake their hand. Oh, hello, so-and-so and such a person. I saw you run from me. But, how, you know. how can you be? How could you be mean to somebody who calls you beloved? <laughs> but uh, so, I think... And, and they're, not, they're not mean to... I can say this much. Every elected official and all of their uh, workers that work with them or for them, no one, not one person, has been disrespectful to me. Good. First of all, I think they know that's probably not a good idea nah, just because really of my not. personality. Yeah. But even if I was like a softy pushover kind of person, they're still not disrespectful. They respect what I do. It doesn't feel good to be a dick. <laughs> well, I mean, they respect what I do. They know that I'm very serious. They know that I'm a mother whose son has been falsely and wrongly in incarcerated. By a racist judge who's probably dead in the dirt by this point. No, he actually, he's not on the bench anymore, but now he teaches law at one of the schools down there in Georgetown. Oh, that's, oh, that's, that's mad problematic. <laughs> So, I, I'm sure. I'm sure. Some. I'm sure. One of my more technically enterprising 
individuals who listen to my podcast could take the information gleaned from here and figure out who that is, but yeah. we're not, we're, we're not going to do that. Yeah, we're so. not going to say the name of, of who that judge is, although I tell you one day, when there I found out what was in my son's jacket, I was so upset. I used curse words, and I have clergy that uh, chimes in, and children. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> I have a bad mouth. I'm so sorry. But I was so angry. I used curse words, but at the end of it, I said, if that judge was here, I would whoop his ass. <laughs> if I would whoop his ass. If I could get my hands on that judge right now, yeah. put us in a boxing ring, and, and he's, a, he's a substantially size man. He's a judge. He's an older man, but he's still, I've seen him. He's, he's big. Yeah. I don't care how big he is. I don't care. You take that black uh, robe off of him and let us, just give us 10 minutes to, alone. And on, <laughs> and, on, and on that happy note, <laughs> Mrs. W so, I'm, I, and I was going to start doing it with this and I didn't yes. realize we are going to do live, but since we're doing it live, I'll also, I'll do it. I wanted to do uh, a shout out. I wanted to, I, I'm, I'm starting to do a shout out portion with the podcast and this is going to be the first one for my listeners okay. so uh shout out to to supporters of the of haggard innovations in the podcast rx reboot are you looking to have a reboot a reboot to your career maybe new resume new change on life life coaching stuff like that go to rxreboot.com and have and have and get a uh, the uh, uh, uh what's the word what was the uh tagline uh, a, per, a, a, a prescription, something. Just go there and it's best best damn life coach in the state, in my opinion. Go, so if you need that, go there. Next up is a shout out to Squeezebox Records, a cool little record store on uh, something something like, like just behind the Cadillac dealership on a, or in a union. And uh, it's go to squeezebox.com. They have a ton of awesome records. And when you walk into this place, I, I kid you not, it basically doubles as a music as a music museum i my one friend my one friend friend of the show kayla fleischman we, we and her went there today and uh she basically was a kid in the candy shop she was able to get three <laughs> awesome records she wanted for awesome nothing is really good awesome. uh, la uh last shout out to it goes to uh shout out goes to uh uh cal visions uh at, at cal visions it's a uh, local streetwear brand where you have high quality prints and uh, online uh, in, in the sort of supreme style model uh, I'm actually going to be picking up a uh, shirt from them myself and I'm going to send a picture and put it on uh, Instagram so for our listeners who follow us uh, at me at, ha at Haggard Innovations keep an eye out for that it's a very it's a GTA Grand Theft Auto style look oh, but, it's, but instead of like it, but, but instead of like from a GTA game they basically took watercolor pictures of different locations in Delaware doing gotcha. the beach and basically structured it and it was really really nice That's and the last nice. shout out goes to Miss Wilson <laughs> where can my where can my guests find you on, online um, I'm going to answer that, and then I'd like, is it okay if I give a quick shout out to one sure, person? Sure, of course, go ahead. Okay, two people, and that's it. First, I'd like to shout out Attorney General Madam Kathy Jennings, mm -hmm. only because... I voted for her, by the way. Yes, Attorney General Kathy Jennings, I've met her since before she was elected. Uh, there's some things about the way she does things that I do not approve, but I do, I shout her out for her honesty and her transparency. One thing I can say about her, even if she doesn't move the way I want her to move on some, some things, mm -hmm. she is honest. And I, I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that in my elected officials. So shout out to Madam Attorney Kathy Jennings and shout out to Dr. Jay Macklin, uh, a woman who has been giving me guidance and support and love and uh, just more than I, I just more than I could possibly dream of. And uh, I want to give her a shout out as well. If people want to contact me, if people want to reach me, please feel free to either, um, I'm trying to think what's the best way. You can go on my website at msnprisonreform.com, you know, and join the movement. You can always go to my Facebook page and direct message me. I'm Rochelle Wilson, M-S-I-N, make some intelligent noise. And of course, finally, uh, you know, I don't want to be inundated with emails because I will definitely get I, to eventually. I will get to them eventually. But if you absolutely must reach out to me, please DM. Uh, I prefer the, the direct message through Facebook, but you can you can that's how we organize email this. <laughs> me at make some intelligent noise 
at gmail.com. Awesome. Make some intelligent noise at gmail.com. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Evan Haggard. This has been a, a High Soapbox. Miss Wilson, thank you for coming. Thank you for having